Three weeks ago, I reviewed Call of Duty with a double jump. Two weeks ago, I reviewed Civ 5 in space. And now I'm reviewing Far Cry 3, but slightly better. This year of very iterative and often technically challenged sequels is finally winding down, and I'm honestly wondering just where a lot of franchises aim to go from here. Far Cry 4 is one of the more effective iterations, that's why it's Far Cry 3 but slightly better after all. It's not exactly a step down from its predecessor in any way, but that just makes it more difficult to say interesting things about it. It's the same engine, same assets, same menus, same formulas from the last game, but the gunplay is slightly faster and slightly less spongy. There's slightly less upgrading to do. There's an auto-drive button to take away a slight bit of monotony from traveling from A to B. There's some throwable meat to give you a slightly more interaction with all the crazy homicidal animals that are everywhere. And thanks to the snowy mountains and chilly pine forests of this new setting, it is slightly closer to actually being Skyrim with guns. That change of setting is honestly the most notable thing about this sequel. Really, the only threads tying together the Far Cry games is their love for outdoor combat, and also the naivete of 80s action movie cliches. Every game is an ultra-violent vacation, built to exploit an exoticized vacation spot, giving us whatever excuse we need to blast away thousands of whoever or whatever may be there. In this case, we're headed to Nepal, which is a setting that doesn't get explored often in video games, or just pop culture in general. I think the last time I blasted away at tigers while flipping around Buddhist ruins was in Tomb Raider 2, and that even was a far cry from where this game is supposed to take place. It's not actually Nepal, of course, because then they wouldn't be able to get away with writing their own backstory for this place. The fictional nation of Kirat feels just alien enough to actually warrant a sense of adventure. It's a whole lot more tempting to explore all the hidden caves, temples, and ruins that are everywhere when you've never seen them look quite like these before. It's just a shame that, just like in a lot of other recent sandbox games, it's easy to see assets and designs become duplicated as you break into the second half of the map. Also, one weird note, this might be the first sandbox game in years where you can't actually go to those mountains in the distance. For a few missions, Sherpas can teleport you into little instance levels in the Himalayas, but outside of those, your helicopter's just gonna sputter and stall and die if you try to fly to them. And speaking of that helicopter, that actually brings up another cool thing I like about this Far Cry. It's kind of generous. It gives you quite a few high-powered exotic pieces early on. You unlock the wingsuit pretty darn early. You can also cheaply buy a ridiculously overpowered grenade launcher that the game considers a sidearm. You unlock that little mini helicopter within the first couple hours, which is awesome because it's so tiny you don't have to worry about finding parking for it. You can squeeze it in anywhere. Just don't try to land it on top of the towers. They planned ahead for that one. Instead, you gotta climb them. You gotta solve some little navigational puzzle that goes on for too long. Then you gotta watch a 30 second cutscene, and then you gotta scroll around the map to find something actually challenging and interesting to do instead of climbing the towers. While this is one of the better Ubisoft sandbox games, it is still very much a Ubisoft sandbox game. And those are always such a time-consuming grind of a checklist. There's an abundance of side quest activities to do, but there's no variety within each category. Once you've done one bomb defusal quest, you've done them all. And of course, you gotta go through a really long upgrading process to make your character even viable for half the combat situations it throws at you. Just like in the last game, a lot of that upgrading happens by grinding through mobs of wild animals that you hunt. Because you can't even hold more than one weapon until you collect three wolf skins or whatever. Compare Far Cry's 3 and 4 to, like, Stalker. They're both open-world FPS sandbox games with ecosystems of wild animals and combating factions fighting one another out in the field, and while one certainly sells a lot, the other is certainly more well-loved by its fans. And in Stalker, if you ever found yourself needing to hunt five wild boars for whatever reason, they wouldn't be bullet sponges that take 30 seconds to kill one at a time. You wouldn't have to hold E to loot the corpse and watch a six-second skinning animation of your character getting grossed out, you just press E and instantly siphon the loot out of it. I, I know, it's a petty complaint, but I really feel like the length of the animations here have so much to do with what makes hunting and scavenging in these games that much more monotonous. It's unnecessarily time-consuming. It's the same deal with the towers. I, I swear, there must be a full-time employee at Ubisoft whose sole job it is is to design the little puzzles that make up each and every tower in so many of their games. They're not even real challenges. They're not stimulating or involving. The whole crux of the exercise is to just turn your head to whatever climbable bit of scenery you might have missed. 
It's a shame because overall, Far Cry 4 is actually pretty darn enjoyable. It's just that in order to make the gameplay itself time efficient and a bit more enjoyable than what it starts you out with, you gotta do a lot of hunting and climb a lot of towers and go through a whole lot of hoops that it needs you to to upgrade your health and your syringes so that you don't have to hold control and watch another really, really long healing animation after taking minor damage. It's a shame, because it's a beautiful game, the combat is snappy and fast, and it does a damn good job of creating over-the-top, unpredictable combat scenarios that mix splash damage, spreading fire, and AI infighting to make combat dynamic and lively almost every time it happens. It also has occasional moments of genuinely funny and self-aware writing that redeem an otherwise mediocre plot. And, just like in the last game, I feel like I'm saying that a lot, most of the really interesting moments come from our villain. Pagan Min plays both the role of a decadent flamboyant king when he's on camera, and a sterile military dictator when he's not. He's way more fun in person. And he begins and ends the game with some really great writing. His scenes branch off into alternate endings and hidden player choices that both lampoon and embrace player agency. He takes the role of Spec Ops's Colonel Conrad here. He uses a lot of double entendres to speak both to the player and the main character. And instead of hamming it up with some guilt-trippy drama, that self-awareness is more played for laughs this time. Which is awesome! There are some genuinely funny jabs during the intro and the outro where he actually uses the entire rest of the plot of the game as the butt of his jokes. It's actually really weird. It's like he was written by an entirely different person than all the other characters. Like he's a outsider in this story existing somewhere outside of the fourth wall. But since he has about 2% of the screen time of this story, it unfortunately undermines the value of the big complicated plot you spend the whole game unraveling. Because if you do happen to accidentally trigger one of those alternate endings within 15 minutes of the game starting, it will literally spoil everything that happens within the next 20 hours. And that's kind of hilarious. I kind of love that. Our hero is an estranged Prince of Karat who gets involved in a civil war between pagan men's men and the revolutionary freedom fighters trying to overthrow him. But oh no, it turns out that the freedom fighters have to face moral dilemmas with no easy answer. Do they use Kairat's limited farming space to grow drugs? Do they preserve Kairat's rich cultural heritage that encourages child marriage? It's such a one-dimensional effort to inject moral complexity into what is otherwise a very lighthearted plot that is so straightforward it's almost patronizing. The plot of the last game became a mess by the end of it, but on your way there, Vass's pirates were unquestionably evil bad guys the whole time. There was no arguing that, but you also had to juggle their lust for violence against the main character's own self-destructive lust for violence, and it gave every combat encounter at least a slight undercurrent of morbid self-awareness. In this game, our hero is more of a blank slate, and the two sides of Kirat's civil war are, uh, easy to generalize. Later on, when Pagan Min throws a party for Pagan Min men, this is how they cheer about it. It's almost surreal how many of the same problems and the same strengths of the previous game are in the same places in this one. Just like in Far Cry 3, the biggest issue with this plot is incredibly specific. It's that the villain doesn't have enough screen time. The game is far more interesting whenever this guy is around, but that only happens in a handful of instances. Outside of those moments, he's just leaving you angry voicemails. But at the same time, none of that is really a downgrade from Far Cry 3. Instead of being a totally self-aware Lewis Carroll subversion about why people think tribal tattoos are douchey or something, Far Cry 4 is a whole lot easier to follow. Maybe that interview where the writer of Far Cry 3 said he didn't think anyone got it made the next writer come into it with a little bit more humility, but I guess there's something to be said of keeping it simple, stupid. As much of a mess as the last game's plot was, it was still a bit more fun to pick apart than this one. I just wish it had more pagan men. So it's a safe iteration that improves a lot on the previous game, and for this reason I'd recommend it above the previous one, but not if you've played that one. You've been there, you've done that, and you're gonna like or hate this game based on the same reasons you liked or hated the last one. 
It's an insane and excessive action rampage through an exotic backdrop that does a fine job of sparking off satisfying moments of both unscripted and set-piece combat. But it still has that same clunky and slow movement system that causes a lot of cheap deaths and animation glitches. It still runs you through a chore grinder of easy, time-consuming optional content. It goes on longer than it needs to, and if you have completionist tendencies, then be warned. Even something this fun will get old at the 50-hour mark. On its long, long way to the finish line, it loses track of its villains and of the merits that make its writing occasionally shine. Most tragic is this tacked-on multiplayer mode that no one's going to be playing in a couple months. The poor handling of Far Cry's first-person movement doesn't exactly make for an elegant multiplayer game, and the balance between our two teams here is laughably thrown out of proportion, since one team can literally turn invisible at will. It's just so sad to see how much time and effort went into fleshing this part of the game out when the campaign is clearly stealing the show. In fact, the campaign is kind of a multiplayer mode now anyways, since they added in some drop-in, drop-out co-op. It's not a real game-changer. It's fun, but totally no frills in its execution. It's probably most practical as a way to efficiently burn through side quests twice as fast. I'd say that the bravest feature in this game is actually the user-made level editor and browser, which you can set up to create a never-ending stream of increasingly strange and creative user-made content. But strange and creative isn't really a good way to describe the rest of the game. There's a hint of enjoyable weirdness to it. There's a bit of it in the writing, in the writable elephants, and the bizarre soundtrack, and the undoubtedly unique choice of setting. It's an entertaining game, but it also represents some of the safest bets a AAA sequel can make. If you didn't play Far Cry 3, I'd encourage you to check this one out when it gets cheaper. You might actually have a blast with it. But if you've been there and done that, then the slight improvements they've made are probably not going to be worth the time and the money it takes to thoroughly enjoy them.